All right, I really didn't even have a title for this morning's message until I was sitting there and I heard the song and I ended up titling it Emptied and Filled Again. I want to read out of uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 36. I typically am kind of like a theme preacher when it comes to these special little holidays, but at the same time, I'm not wanting to just preach a Mother's Day message that, you know, I, I got to stay true to what God's the way God's called me to preach. Amen. And I think that we'll be able to get both of those accomplished out of today's message. The Lord definitely put the story regarding the time frame of Elisha in my heart. It's from, it's from, it's all the, it's a large passage of reading. You know, I used to feel weird about reading a lot, but Paul told young Timothy to pay attention to the public reading of scripture, that it's an important thing. So I don't really apologize for that anymore, but I did cut some of the passage out because it was really long and I'll just tell you, you know, when we're going to skip to the next part of the verse. So here we go. Second Kings chapter four, starting in verse one. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha saying, thy servant, my husband is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So back in those days, whenever a person didn't have money to pay their debt, they could indenture themselves into slavery. That's where we get the thought of the jubilee, the bond slave that willingly a Jewish brother could willingly submit himself to his other Jewish brother, serve him as a slave for seven years. But then at the jubilee or the, or the Shemitah, the seven year period, he was released and allowed to go free. All of his debt had been paid, which is a type of Jesus paying the debt for us, but also she had no husband, she had debt, and the creditor says, I'm going to take your sons. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid has not anything in the house, save or except a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all your neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when you are come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of, off the rest. Or of the rest, it means off the rest. We're going to skip to verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread. Now, I didn't really put this in the, in the text of, of what I was going to preach on, but I just wanted to point something out. The word constrained literally means that she was aggressive in this. She like wasn't going to take no for an answer. Whenever she would see the man of God walking near her home, she would constrain him. She would actively say to him, I want you to come in and I want you to see what she's actively asking him to do. I want you to come in and to eat bread with us. Now, this is many, many years before, really, this is probably time frame, I'm saying like 800 B.C., so about 800 so years before the time of Jesus. So this is long before the Last Supper, long before the First Communion, right? But at the same time, we see these types written throughout the scripture. For instance, when Abraham went to meet Melchizedek and Melchizedek <clears throat> offered him wine and bread, the concept of communion. One of the things that I want you to see in here, one of the main ideas that I want you to see is that this woman wanted to have communion. Yes, I'm using Elisha as a type of Christ, but one of the things that we need to understand is, is that the prophet of God in the Old Testament was the mouthpiece of God. And Elisha in this story represents God. And what this woman wanted was for God to come into her home. She wanted to have communion with the Lord. Listen, even if we're not talking about communion, it is a very personal and a very intimate thing in some, in some sense to invite people. It's different when, even when you go to a restaurant and you eat with other people. 
but it's a whole different story whenever you invite people into your home and they sit at your table and you eat with them. There's a level of fellowship and communion that takes place. You don't just invite any old person to your house to come eat with you, right? She's wanting to have communion with the presence of God is how I'm seeing this. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread, and she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber. You know, I used that scripture a while back where it says, Always sanctify the Lord thy God in thy heart and be willing to give one someone a reason for the joy that is within you. A separate place. The Lord tells us in the scripture to find a separated out place. Jesus needs a special place in your heart. Amen. He needs to take precedence over everything else that's going on in the world. I preach to the preacher this morning when I say that there's so many things that are vying in competition for the presence of Lord in our heart. Seek ye first, we said last Wednesday, the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. If we would just have a sanctified or a separated out little chamber of the place for the Lord to be in our hearts and if we would make Him, like the Bible says, Preeminent. Hallelujah. He would be the first one. That's right. Not your relationship. Listen, if you get the, that relationship right, then other proper relationships in your life will be right. If you get that relationship, listen, if you will allow the grace of the Holy Spirit to have his way in your heart, it's so much more powerful than you trying to live according to rules, law, legalism. The Holy Spirit will speak things if you keep your heart soft to the Lord. I'm telling you, he'll speak things to you like if you showed up to work three minutes late you need to get yourself up five minutes earlier son so that you can be to work on time simple things like that get yourself to work on time do the right thing just because somebody gives you some lip doesn't mean you have to give them lip back even if you can whoop them and none of that matters you're supposed to be humble on this earth you're supposed to lower yourself so that I can be elevated in you because I didn't just go around whooping everybody just because I could right Help us, Lord. Yes. A little chamber in your heart. A little sanctified place. A separated out place. Man, this woman, this was a great woman. The Bible said of her. She was a woman of substance. Listen, her husband had money. But her husband wasn't the one that was over here saying, let's build a little chamber on the side of our house so that we can invite God into the midst of our home. So that we can have communion and fellowship with the Lord. She said, I pray thee on the wall, let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it, it shall be when he comes to us that he shall turn in there. And it fell on a day that he came there and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said unto him, Say now unto her, it's kind of strange, huh? The prophet says, okay, Gehazi, tell this woman to come in here. Now tell this woman. She's standing right there. Now tell this woman, you know. And, and so then his servant comes. But that's how really the Lord works, right? The, you know, the Father has a plan, amen, because of what Jesus did on the cross and died and gave us his righteousness. We can now have communion. The Bible says we can boldly enter the throne room of grace. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit and he speaks to us. And God is now speaking to this woman. And he says, what shall we do for you? He says unto her, behold, you have been careful with us. Meaning you have taken great care with all this care. What is to be done for you? Would you be spoken for to the king? Do you want me to go to the king and tell him what a wonderful woman you are? Or to the captain of the host? Do you want me to go to the general of the army so you can have some special protection? She answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily, she has no child, and her husband is old. Now, I got to tell you that there was more. I'm going to skip through to verse 17, but I got to tell you that she was like, oh, prophet, prophet, man of God, please don't lie. You know, she just wasn't believing the word that was being spoken to her. But indeed, Elisha spoke the word. And in verse 17, it says, and the woman conceived and bare a son. At that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. He said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to 
a lad carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat her on her knees till noon and then died. There's a lot more to the story here. The woman goes and she finds her. She goes in to find the prophet and the prophet sees her coming and he sends Gehazi to find out the story. And ultimately the prophet tells Gehazi to go ahead of him and to bring the staff and you know, he ends up laying the staff on the boy. But, but I noticed that Elisha kind of did something that Jesus did in the story of Lazarus. He kind of hung behind a little bit. He hung behind. He let Gehazi go ahead of him. And he hung behind just like in the story of Lazarus where Jesus waited another four days. And we talked about that not that long ago because we said that, that Jesus wants us to be four day dead. You know, I, I don't I know I already preached this recently, but I think that it's a very important concept that you and I will have to deal with for the rest of our Christianity. And the quicker that we can get a revelation of it and start to walk in it, the better off we'll all be for it. That many times we think we're at the end of something. That's what I'm talking about. Four day dead. But Lord, he stinketh is what they said. Because he was really, really, really dead. I'm talking spiritual stuff now. Right. Many times there's things in our life that we think that we're dead to. Oh, well, I'm over that. I'm done with that. And, the, and we're like, okay, Lord, I'm ready for the deliverance now, Lord. I finally got to. I see what you've been trying to tell me, Lord. Uh, you, you, you really allowed all kinds of things to take place. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm really dead now. And I really want this thing to be delivered. I'm ready to get up and walk out the tomb. I'm ready for the new life that you have prepared for me. But you see, this is the thing. The Lord isn't like you or I. The Lord peers into the heart of man, the thing that he molded with clay upon the wheel. He knows every hair on your head and he knows when you're really, really dead. He knows when you're really, really ready. He knows when you're going to be four day dead. And I'm telling you, just like Elisha waited behind, just like Jesus waited behind. No, he, you want deliverance in your life. Listen, sometimes it has to start off with the prayer that says, Lord, I, I want to be what you want me to be. But right now, my want to ain't where it needs to be. I need you to change my want to, Lord. I need you to change the desires of my heart. I need you to change the taste buds on my tongue. I want a new flavor in my mouth, Lord. I want to taste you. I want to know that taste and know that you are good. I don't want any more of what the world's offering. The world keeps leaving me empty, keeps leaving me broken in the wrong way. Lord, I want to be filled up with what you offer. The Lord knows. The Lord, the Lord knows, man. What are we doing over here? I can't get off of this right now. What are we doing? Are we playing games with the most high? Well, we're playing games in our mind with the most high, and instead of hiding him in a little sanctified chamber in our heart, we hide our sin in our heart. Lord, help us. He knows. He sees. Lord, help us. Verse 31. It says, And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, or upon them, like, closed the door, and it was just them two in the room. And he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up. Now I want you to see this, because, man, I'm telling you, this is so good. I know that there's a lot more here than probably what I got out of it, and I'm... But look, he lay upon the child. He put his mouth upon his mouth. He put his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. You know, one of the things that at some point in time, I know that I'm going to get to it in the passage of Scripture. But what I'm seeing here, like, like once again, Elisha is a type of Christ. This boy right here is a type of you and me. There's death right here. It's physical death in the story, but I'm here to tell you that the first time you were born of your father, Adam, you were born spiritually dead. And in some way, shape, or form, listen, sometimes even as a Christian, you may find yourself walking through life and you feel as though you've become almost spiritually dead again. The life of God has been removed from you. You don't even know how you're going to make it. In some way, shape, or form, I'm telling you, Elisha's life was shared with this little boy. And when he laid on him, his eyes on his eyes, his mouth on his mouth, his hands on his hands, that cold body. Look, look, look what it says. 
He stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. The flesh of the child began to get warm. Maybe you find yourself in a place in your spiritual walk where you have grown cold. You know, maybe you find yourself in a place in your spiritual walk where the embers that used to glow and burn brightly and could have ignited a fire on the side of you have now turned to ash and they're almost about to be snuffed out. But I got good news. The presence of the Lord will show up and your cold, dead spirituality can be revived. Hallelujah. And the child waxed. Warm. The warmth of life began to infiltrate his dead body and began to change things right there. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him again. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and he said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she was come in unto him, he said, take up your son. What a story. Amen. Amen. You know, in this passage of scripture, there contains two different stories of two different mothers who lived in Israel during a time when there was great immorality in the land. Ahab, and you remember Ahab, we just recently learned about him. Ahab had been the king of Israel for quite some time, and he had married a Phoenician woman from Tyre named Jezebel. I like my little map, so I'm going to draw me a map. But Tyre was an area... So this is the Sea of Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea. This little area between these two bodies of water, Mediterranean Sea, Jordan River. This is the strip of land known as Israel. This right here, the scholars call that the Fertile Crescent, the Tigris, the Euphrates. Anyway, this place right here is Mount Carmel. Y'all remember Mount Carmel? That's the famous place where what happened? Elijah had his showdown with the prophets of Baal. Who were the prophets of Baal working for? They were working for Jezebel, which was Ahab's wife. Ahab's wife was from a little area up here, just a little bit north, a place called Tyre and Sidon, two ports. Tyre was where Jezebel was from. Now, the interesting thing about Tyre, and I don't mean to get too deep on you because this is, you know, I'm not trying to go there, but I will say this. The interesting thing about Tyre is that you know, there's two Old Testament passages that describe Satan for us. Both of them, though, are referencing a king. Now, if you do your own research, especially if you get on Google, they'll say, this isn't talking about Satan. This is talking about a physical king. Yeah, it is talking about a physical king through whom Satan is working. Satan has been working through physical kings upon the earth for thousands of years of human history. And the, and the king of Tyre, whenever it talks about in Isaiah 14, he says, give us a lament for the king of Babylon. Then it transitions from a human king into this lion devil. Right. Then in Ezekiel, it says, give a lament for the king of Tyre. And he talks about how, how he was full of beauty until, and he was perfect until sin was found in him. And it goes on and on. What I need you to really understand about Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia is that it was full of occultic activity. I'm talking about it was bad. That's why up here, the people, you know, the, the tribe of Dan was up here in the north. Now, we're not going to get into that too deep. Some of you probably remember some of the teachings we did on the tribe of Dan. But what I will tell you, and the connection maybe to the Antichrist, but what I will tell you is that Dan was in a perfect location, considering the fact that that's where one of those golden calves was placed. Do you remember that? We talked about that whenever we were studying about the northern and the southern kingdom. And that down here in the area of Samaria was one of those calves and the other one was in the north near the tribe of Dan. The main point that I'm saying is, is that that's why the northern kingdom of Israel was so affected. Because there was so much strong occultic activity that was taking place over there. If you go back and you read in the Bible itself, you don't have to read extra biblical material. You will begin to realize that the occult was so alive and well. And it was beginning to infiltrate into the children of God's lives. It was beginning to affect the people of God. The reason that I bring that up is because the same context that was in is the same context that is today. The scenario provides a context for mothers today. I need you to know that it provides a place where you need to understand where you're raising your children. 
See, mothers today in the America that we live in are seeing a harvest of evil like never before. I'm not going to get into all the details, but listen, back in the early 40s, even in the 50s, especially the 60s, seeds of occultic lies, seeds that were planted for evil have now begun to produce a harvest. We just think, oh my gosh, the times are getting so bad. No, this is methodical, man. This is a methodical plan. Of, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to get weird on you. It is what it is. We ain't cutting nothing out of black magic, of satanic sorcery that has been placed on a grand scale. See, back when I was, I don't even know if I should get into all this, but back when I was really, really, really in the world and I thought I was cool, I was hanging out with this dude that was, he was a warlock because of what he said. And he'd go around and give everybody drugs. And I remember one time, you know, I remember one time he brought me to this to this witch's house, and he told me, "Okay, you just got to be cool, dude. You got to act. You just got to be cool, you know." And anyway, whenever whenever we left, he's like, "Man, she told me never to bring you back again." He said she feels this really bad vibe, you know. And then one time he told me that there was this girl, man, that girl, da 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 da, like she. And I thought she was kind of cute. And it was kind of weird because she was raised by a witch. So I'm like, okay. So I tried to talk to her one day, and she's like, she wouldn't talk to me. I'm like, dude, you told me that girl liked me, bro. What's up with this? Oh no, she she said she felt some weird vibes on you, man. I'm here to tell you that it's bigger than just like him. He was casting like little spells on people and trying. To, or trying to help open doors for people like if you like this girl then you know you get your little spell done and you could like have some you know whatever the case that was like a little micro spell what I'm trying to tell you is is that Satan is into big spells he's into causing huge cultural changes it might be too big for people's brain to be able to handle this but I'm just going to preach what I know to be the truth based upon what I've learned from the word of God and hopefully it's not too big for for us to grab a hold of, but I'm here to tell you that seeds of lies have been planted in the soil of America, and we're seeing a harvest being produced today that is causing evil to be rampant in the land, immorality to be rampant in the land, and it's not just an accident. See, back in the day, whenever I was young, I can still remember starting in school at L.J. Alamo Elementary, and yeah, I was probably one of the worst kids in the school. Like, I got more paddles than anybody. But one of the things that I remember, on that intercom, the principal would get on there, we'd say a prayer to the Lord, we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance over the intercom, and everybody would engage in that. The Ten Commandments was in the school. We had God would, had been invited in the school, because even though this was supposed to be the melting pot of the world, this nation was believed by the inhabitants of it to have been founded on the principles of God. He was our God. He was the God that sent Jesus to die on the cross, and even though we might not have been completely sold out like the prophets of old, we still wanted him in our society. Hallelujah. But then we kicked him out. Oh, it's not on accident. Yeah, the church fell asleep. The church didn't do what they were going to do. But listen to me. You're fighting against something bigger than you ever realized. You're fighting against sorcery. You're fighting against satanic magic. You Listen, you're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Lord, help us. We're over here so caught up in our own little world. We ain't got time to pray for the kingdom. We don't have time to pray for the church. We don't have time to pray for souls. Lord, help us. This is what you're raising your children in the midst of mom, dad. Worse than that, child of God, this is what you're living in. See, but like Israel of old, influenced by this satanic move. I know I use this scripture a lot, but Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This, we ought not be this way. We ought not be falling asleep at the wheel. Why? Because we used to be them. But we were awakened from the dead. Look what it says. You has he quickened. What does that mean? To give life. Yeah. You were dead when he gave you life. Just like Elisha laid on top of that dead boy and began to breathe the breath of life. You were dead in your sin before you were born again. But God breathed life on the inside of you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Next verse. Where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. He wasn't just talking about you walking down some pathway. He's talking about the way you lived your life, the way you handled your business. Do you remember what you were like before you let Jesus into your heart? Come on, somebody. Help me out here. 
Do you remember what you were like before you let Jesus have his way in your heart? You were walking a course, man. You were walking a course that was leading to death. Yes. According to the prince of the power of the air. See, he's moving. This is a big influence. This is all a plan. These are seeds that are going to be harvested. He has a plan for the end times too. I read the book. He doesn't win, but he has a plan. And he's trying to drag his men. And the Bible says in the end days, anything that can be shaken will be shaken. You stand here and you think even just because you stand behind a pulpit that you're so strong that you can't be shaken. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's deception from Satan. And until you learn how to hold on to Jesus and let him give you hind's feet and you stand upon the rock that cannot be moved, then you also could be shaken in these last days. Let me tell you something. I believe that there is great deception coming upon the earth. I do believe that there is an opportunity for great revival. I do pray, Holy Spirit, breathe fresh upon your church. Breathe fresh. Give your people the power that they need. Because every time that evil gets worse, guess what? The Lord will cause a glow. He'll blow and cause a glow and the embers of his fire to burn. Because even in the midst of the mighty Roman Empire, that little group of disciples, hallelujah, baptized with the Holy Ghost, filled with the presence of God, Preach the gospel, amen. And the church was born and it still lives on today. The darkness could not apprehend it. The Bible says that he was light given by God and the darkness, it says it couldn't comprehend it in the Greek. I'm sorry, in the, in the King James, but the idea in the Greek is couldn't apprehend it, couldn't overtake it. Oh, it knows it's here, but it can't do nothing about it. God's light continues to live on. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. See, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself getting a little bit spiritually prideful. <coughs> when I start realizing, well, I'm not like that one, and I don't do what that one does, and yeah, it's a bunch of garbage, man. You were living your life like the worst of them. Yeah. If it wouldn't be for the grace of God, you'd still be living just yeah. like them. You didn't just pull it. No, no, daddy. See, my daddy says, hey, come on, boy. Hunker down and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, dude, son. You got to just get it done. Man. You ain't getting it done in this one, dad. I don't care how tough you are. You ain't going to pop the devil in his jaw and win this fight. No. I don't care how bad you are, how tough you are, how strong you are. You are not going to win this battle in the physical. The less of you there is, I don't want to get ahead of myself, the more opportunity there is for the Lord. The more you empty yourself out, the more he can fill you up. Amen. Amen. A modern mother's, modern mother's face, a similar environment in America today as they raise their children in the midst of a society that has rejected God. And in the midst of a church, according to 2 Timothy 3, 5, that has a form of of godliness but denies the power thereof. Form is where we get our word morphe. It's where we the, 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 the compound word metamorphosis comes from. The idea talks about an outward shape. You know, you can walk up in a church and we can have all the music going on and everybody just dressed just right and we can have the Christianese lingo, you know, we just, oh yes brother, oh yes sister, and we know all these words and we can just fit right in just like a chameleon, just taking on a form and a shape, but denying the power thereof. No, God has come to do more than just us speak some common language and not allow a change to take place on the inside of our hearts. The airways of music bombard the minds of both children and adults alike and produces an alternate narrative. I'm just trying to tell you, man. I know I talk about it a lot, but I'm not shrinking back. I know it to be true. The music industry and Hollywood produce an alternate narrative and bombard our minds with that and produce in us or make us begin to think that certain things are okay. Things that contradict the very word of God, contradict the scriptures of God. A narrative where drugs in the party and the, the exhibition of violence against authority and the treatment of women as objects of pleasure is the norm. That's what the music industry would try to promote to us. A society that numbs our mind to homosexuality and the ability of a woman to choose life or death for her unborn child. This is a little hard for a Mother's Day message, right? One time somebody visited on Mother's Day. I think it was our first year we were at church. It was an old friend of mine. And I said, hey, man, what's your wife thought about the message? She said, man, that was a little bit hard for a Mother's Day message. 
<laughs> We're not into church growth over here. We're into Jesus build your church. Amen. Amen. Although I will pray, Lord, let Matt's personality move out the way if it's causing harm to your kingdom. But anyway, I just know how to preach it one way. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> they will numb us and deceive us into thinking that this is the norm, but this is not the new norm. This is blasphemy. This is the lie of hypocrisy. Listen to me. You can, and if you're on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I hope I, hope I never get me. I'm not trying to judge you. If you're on Facebook, do your thing, boo. I'm just trying to say, I don't want nothing to do with that garbage, man. I start thinking like that. I get all messy again. I want to be messy. Man, I don't want to be messy. I don't even want to care about all them people's mess. I don't want to work, focus on me. I got enough of my own mess. Lord, help me. Just another distraction. Oh, look, I ain't so bad. Look how bad they are. No, I got things I need the Lord to deal with. Amen. I know you could use it for good, but do we really that often? I mean, come on. That's between you and Jesus. Preach it, brother. It's a lie of hypocrisy. The end days. 2 Timothy 4.4 4 says that they would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 1 Timothy 4.1.2 says the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some, sh some shall depart from the faith and give heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Listen to me, we're not talking about David Koresh here. We're not talking about the Waco incident. We're not talking about Jim Jones and drinking the Kool-Aid. We're talking about people that mean well, that stand behind pulpits. Listen, I got myself in a whole lot of trouble, dude. Calling, like, not necessarily trying to call out preachers, just don't really know how to do what it was that I was supposed to do. Doing all this research on the back end and trying to come back to these people that I had relationships with and even went to the point where I bought them all books. I'm like, look, dude, here, here's a book, here's a book, here's a book, here's a book. This guy right here was in New Age. This guy right here was in the midst of it and he saw, he came out of it. The Lord saved him. And then he began to read this purpose-driven life book. I said it, Rick Warren, I said I did the research, dude. Then Saddleback, California, they went knocking on people's doors. Oh, you know, they, they say, don't touch the anointed of the Lord. Well, hold on a second. Are we even near the anointing? Or, or is this a different kind of anointing? Oh, now you're really treading on thin ice. Well, maybe I am. But if you think for one second that there could not be people that, that present themselves as preachers in America that aren't really working for the Lord to begin with, and we allow ourselves to be, to shut our mouth because we're concerned that people are going to get the wrong opinion of us. People are like, oh, if you just preach the truth, then they won't buy into a lie. No, I have found, I'm just going to say something, I have found that God's people are very naive. I have found that Matt Abair can be very naive. And just want to see the best in everybody. Right. And the reality of it is, is that no, there is a real devil and a real deception that is taking place. And let me tell you something. When somebody builds their whole concept on knocking on the doors of the world and goes to them and it's written in their own literature. I don't have to make anything up. And it goes door to door to the world and says, what can we do for our services to make them more conducive for you? What can we do in our services to make them more palatable for you? Get rid of the choir robes. Make this message not quite as hard. Make the message a little bit shorter. Make us comfortable, preacher. You know, dim the lights a little bit. I don't have a problem with dimming lights a little bit, but whatever. Dim the lights a little bit. Make the atmosphere more conducive, kind of like to what we were used to. What, so what? You want me to make the church look like a club. You want me to entertain you. You want me to have an entertainment spirit. Why don't we just go ahead and get some smoke machines and some strobe lights? Why don't we go ahead and make you feel real comfortable like you? That's the church growth movement. That ain't in the word of God. Listen to me. When the people of God in the book of Acts came together, you know what they did? They broke bread. They took communion. And they paid attention to the apostles' doctrine. And their relationship was connected to Jesus. And what Jesus did. And if that ain't good enough, then we ain't got the real thing. Is he the topic of our conversation? This is my introduction. I'm just trying to make a point that we live in the midst of a society that is immoral like the society where these two mothers lived. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel had produced much problems in the kingdom of God. There's much problems in the kingdom of God, Mom. Dad, child of God, we got to take a stand. There's always been a remnant in the body of Christ, a people that would stand on the truth of the gospel. 
We got to dig deep to find what the word of God is really saying and stay true to God's word. Two stories, two moms who lived in the midst of a really bad time. And I just kind of asked the question, what can we learn from their stories that we could use in our lives today? Point number one. You ready? Here we go. When your strength dies, he can finally go to work. Amen. I love preaching. This is probably one of my points in every one of my messages. Amen. Because it's so true in the gospel. I was telling somebody the other day, I don't remember where it was. I think I might have told two different people. I'm telling the girls at work in the, in, the, in the billing office. I'm like, look, dude, all of our life, you know, mama said, hurry up and get out of diapers. Hurry up and get that baba out your mouth. I can remember daddy, we were riding down the road to go see his family in Baton Rouge. He, <laughs> he reached over, I'll tell you all this story. Well, he reached over there, he pulled that noonie out of Cynthia's mouth. <laughs> He chucked it out the window. And look, dude, it wasn't 10 minutes later. My dad had bowed to the, to the God of Noonie. He stopped at the 7-Eleven and he bought another Noonie. The point that I'm trying, he couldn't know, dude. I'm like, dude, you got to fix this problem. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that we're trying to hurry up and get people to grow up. Get them out of diapers. Get them off the bye-bye. Get them off the noonie. Hurry up. Grow up. Get to school. Get through school. Get into college. Come on. Be independent. Pay your bills. And Lord knows we don't want no 32-year-old baby in a diaper still sucking on a bye-bye. I remember Brad Bullock said, man, the church is full of babies. Sometimes you got to part the whiskers to stick the bottle in there. <laughs> I do that way with words. Part the whiskers to stick the bob in the mouth. Anyway, what we're doing is we're constantly trying to cause people to grow up and to become independent. But there's an there's a, a an opposite thing going on in the gospel that says, "Unless you come unto me as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of God." So which one is it, Lord? Well, guess what? I want you to be able to take care of your business, but I need you to learn how to trust and depend on me. Right. Child can't even go into the refrigerator and get a, get a glass of milk for himself without making a huge mess. Dependent. That is a repeated theme within the gospel. See, dependence upon God because mankind wants to take matters in his own hands. Amen. Now that, that right there is a truth that we should all be amen. amen. We have a problem letting go. We have a problem relinquishing control. We start to feel nervous. We start to feel, feel fearful. We don't know what's going to happen. We have a problem trusting the Lord. When your strength dies, his can finally go to work. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant did fear the Lord... And the creditor, the devil, the evil one, is coming to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. My husband is dead, man of God. My husband is dead, Lord. During these Bible times, a woman's husband was her strength. Oh, I know we've gotten all... You know, women are now liberated. And, and listen, I get it, man. You know, look, the Bible was written at a different time. It doesn't mean that God changes. But the reality of it is, is that in those time frames, that's how it was. I do believe the Bible is clear that a woman is a weaker vessel. It just is what it is. I'm not saying that a woman could never be a good president. That's not what I'm getting at. Sometimes women are so much more organized than men. It's not even funny. I've seen that in my own life. But what I'm trying to say is this, that, a, that God created a woman to be a weaker vessel. Yeah. And in these time frames that they were living in, and all the women said, amen, we're in a good church. <laughs> amen, we're in a good church. And in these time frames that we lived in, the husband was an immediate source of a woman's strength. But her strength had died. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to kind of tell you the story. There's a similar concept. Israel as a whole has just lost her strength. The scripture says in the year King Uzziah died. Uzziah means strength. In the year King, see, Israel looked to their king for strength. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. 
Isaiah got a visual of the Lord. See, sometimes you need your own strength to die and to move out of the way before you can have your personal connection to the Lord in order to receive the strength that you need. On that day, it was a beautiful scene, a powerful scene. The train of the robe of the Lord filled the temple with the glory of God, and there were burning ones, the seraphim, burning ones. And they sat there, and they, with, with two wings, they covered their eyes with two. They covered their feet with two. They did fly, and they were facing one another. And the burning ones cried out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the pulse of the temple began to move from the ones that cried aloud. And then the Lord, and then listen, he, you know what happened whenever I say, I love this. This really, and then, and I'm just talking about your strength dying. I'm talking about your strength having to move out the way, but you, you, got, you got to preach this because it's so good. Because you know what Isaiah said? See, sometimes we get so prideful when we make our spiritual connection to the Lord. It's in the heart of man. Spiritual pride. Man wants to be puffed up. But let me tell you something. When you truly get into the presence of the Lord, something happens. Instead of being puffed up, you start to get broken. You start to get broken. You start to realize if it weren't for Jesus dying on the cross and giving me his righteousness, I wouldn't have no right in this place at all. Amen. You become humbled in the presence of the Lord. The prophet Isaiah said, woe unto me. See, whenever he saw the Lord, he said, woe unto me. For I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. But God's got a plan and one of the burning ones with tongs took a coal from off the altar. It would have been the altar of sacrifice, a type of the cross. Touched it to my lip, he said. Touched it to my lip, he said, you are cleansed. And then the Lord called him. The Lord called him, who shall I send? He said, send me, Lord. The point that I wanted to make is this, is that this woman's husband had died. Her strength had died. Israel's king had died. Their strength had died. And it's whenever our strength begins to die that his power can finally go to work. You know, the scripture talks about this, you know, throughout the scriptures, throughout the Bible. You know, she's saying, I'm weak. My husband is gone. They're going to make my boys slaves. I need help down here, Lord. I used to like it when Lauren used to say that. I hear her listen to him preach all the time. I need some help down here, Lord. Yes. First <laughs> Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. In your state of weakness, one of the things that you need to understand is you can cast your care upon him. You know that word care in the Greek means distraction and anxiety. What are you going through today that's causing chaos in your life? What are you going through today that's causing a distraction in your life, causing anxiety in your life? I got to tell you that what the word of God says, take that anxiety, take that distraction and casteth, casteth it upon the Lord. What does it mean? It means to throw. I got a bad habit of chunking stuff sometimes. I'm not going to do it. Just to throw it, to throw it upon the Lord. I don't want it, Lord. I don't want it, Lord. You, you got to take it. This one's for you. You got broader shoulders. I can't carry this thing. Yeah, yeah. Or you can just hunker down like daddy would say, come on, boy. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Get her done, son. And you can just keep on trudging through life, trying to carry all your anxieties and all your pain and all your heartache. Just try to like, I just got to be tough, man. No, you know what? I have found great power. You know what? I have found great power in the presence of the Lord. And let me tell you something. When I've been in the presence of the Lord, there's something that weird that happens to me. I cry like a little baby. I'm not just trying to say just because I shed a tear that that means anything's good about my heart. I'm just trying to make a point. Like Isaiah, I see myself for who I really am. I can remember one time when the Lord, Lord first started moving in my life and I would go up to the front. You know, I used to do that all the time. I'd go up to the front to worship the Lord. And, at, and that was at a time when I was closer to God than I ever was. Probably, and I'm just saying, like, Lord knows I wasn't perfect. But probably had less sin in my life than ever before. And what I had a desire to do was to go to the altar to worship the Lord. Yes. And you remember one of the times, like, and, and I can remember I was sitting towards the back. It was at Cornerstone Ministries. And the Lord was moving on my heart. I had already been worshiping him in my house. And he was, he was saying, come to the altar. Come to the altar, son. Worship me at the altar. And I remember the first time I did it, I bowed down on my knees and I was worshiping the Lord. 
And dude, I'm telling you, don't ever think that the enemy, I know what the word of God says, that the voice of a stranger, they will not hear. We're not supposed to be following the voice of a stranger. But if you think that the enemy of your soul won't try to whisper in your ear, you got another thing coming. And when I was down there upon my face, worshiping the Lord, I know it wasn't the Lord. It had to be the enemy. He said, there's people in this place that think you're a fool. There's people in this place that think you're a fool because you're over here, you're on your knees and you're worshiping the Lord. They think you're weak. And then the Lord, like the Lord always does, he showed up on the other side and he says, they may think you're weak, but I'm making you stronger than they will ever know. They'll never know about the strength that I'm teaching you whenever you bow your knee to me and surrender your life to me and allow yourself to be humiliated for me. Is that really that humiliating to get into the presence of the Lord? But the enemy has a way of contorting and distorting our thoughts. And what the Lord was telling me, I'm about to teach you about a strength that that you ain't never tapped into before, boy. I'm about to teach you about something about how the God of glory, you pour yourself out, you allow your strength to die so that my strength can show up, and I'm about to get you through something that you never thought that you could have made it through. Hallelujah. God is so good. Cast all your distractions and your anxiety upon him. Throw it on him because he's big enough to carry. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. We're talking about... When our strength dies, his can finally go to work. I love this passage of scripture. You know, scholars and preachers always try to figure out what Paul's born was. <laughs> I personally feel like, everybody's got to give their opinion. <laughs> he says, a messenger from Satan was sent to buffet me, to come against me, to stop me. So it was a messenger from Satan. What I believe <clears throat> is that it was the Judaizers. Satan through human beings went everywhere Paul went. You can see, read it in the letter if you read it. He said, to prevent me, to buffet me because of the many revelations that had been given unto me so that I not be puffed up with pride. Mm -hmm. See, God allowed the Apostle Paul to see things in the scriptures that other people couldn't see. Right, right. And he was going over here like a wild man for Jesus and he was planting churches all over the Mediterranean Sea and everywhere that he went, the Judaizers, these People from Jerusalem who said you still had to be circumcised and had all their little traditions and all their little laws that they were going to add were coming in behind him and frustrating the grace of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that would frustrate me. Hmm. If I was over here planting churches and telling people the truth, truth that I knew was of the Lord because the Lord had gotten me in the back of the Arabian desert and had revealed his truth to me. And then these people were coming behind me and frustrating the grace of God, I would be so aggravated. He said, I asked the Lord to remove this thing from me three times. You know what the Lord told him? My grace is sufficient. But Lord, remove it. My grace is sufficient. But take it away, Lord. This can't be of you. I need this thorn out of my side. I can't run as fast with this thorn in my side. My grace is sufficient for you. He said that. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, when your strength dies, his can finally come to life. Amen. It can finally go to work because it's when we're weak that he's strong. Because it's when we're moved out of the way that he is allowed to do what it is that he wants to do. But as long as we're over here gasping for air and struggling to stay alive, our old man that gets in the way, we prevent, we thwart the plan of God in our lives. We have to come to the place where we say, my husband or my strength is dead and I need your help. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I don't know that he felt that way all of the time. I don't know that he never felt bad or that he never felt frust frustrated. I think that he probably did. But I guarantee you as he continued on with the Lord one of the things that he realized was that sometimes you know that, that once he was going to make it through that when all of this confusion was going on and all of this chaos was taking place that if he would just make it through he was going to be able to look backwards and he was going to be able to see how the Lord was in it and how the Lord was getting him to a place of weakness. How the Lord was getting him to a place of surrender. How the Lord was trying to move him out of the way so that Jesus 
could show up. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 28 through 30, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know I use this scripture a lot, but a yoke, y'all know what that was? It was a piece of equipment that would tie two farm animals together so that you could get more ox power. I'm going to say it like that. Oxen power out of two than you would from one. And you'd yoke them together. You'd connect them. And you'd always put one that was older with one that was younger so the older one could teach the younger one. And the correlation is this. Spiritually speaking, you got to yoke yourself to Jesus. Spiritually speaking, he's the workhorse in this relationship. Yeah. You're weary. You're heavy laden. You've been carrying the burden upon your back. And I don't care how broad your shoulders are. You can't carry the burden in your own strength. And you'll start to get weak. And you'll start to stumble. But the Lord said, come unto me if you're weary. Come unto me if you're heavy laden. I will give you strength. Yoke yourself to me. Learn of me. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He doesn't want to make your burden hard. He wants to lighten the load. That's, he's a good God. Yes, he, he wants to lighten the load. Amen. He wants to pour grace. Man, look, grace. What a beautiful thing. Grace, man. I look at grace like it's like a download from the Lord, man. You know, this, you, I know I talk about this a lot, but here you are down here on this earth. You know, you're really in Christ. So let's put it like that. Because if you weren't in him, you couldn't have access to grace. You're in it. The prepositional phrase, in him, in whom, in Christ, you're in him. How'd you get there? Well, we're about to get there. But look, grace, who's the hands on earth today? I wrote the hands for everyone. Who's the hands on earth today? Who's the hands and the feet on earth today? Jesus said it's expedient that I go, for if I do not go, he will not come. When Jesus was on earth, he was the hands and the feet, the Holy Spirit moving and operating through him. He was the mouthpiece of God. Listen, Jesus said, when I go, he will come. The Holy Spirit is now the mouthpiece, the hands. He's living in us. He's moving through us. The grace of God is a divine. That's what it says, the definition in the Strong's Concordance. Divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. Reflection in the life. It's an inside job. Grace Amen. comes from the person of the Holy Spirit and is downloaded from the Holy Ghost into you based upon only because of the finished work of Jesus that made you righteous. Not because you prayed enough. Now, don't get me wrong now. You had to make, you want, you want more grace in your life. You're going to have to avail yourself to the presence of God. That's it. You want, you want more of the Lord? Guess what? He says that you seek me, you will find me. You're not going to earn it of your own merit. No, Jesus earned it for you. The great exchange took place. He took your guilt. He gave you his righteousness. Now you can avail yourself to the presence of the Lord. Yeah, you get a download from the Holy Spirit, something called grace that changes you Hallelujah. on the inside. Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will be like wind underneath the eagle's wings for you. I will lift you up. You will run and you will not grow weary. Hallelujah. Because now you're operating in my strength. I'm here to tell you God is real. And I'm here to tell you that he can heal. And he can make whole. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you face, no matter how bad your heart has been hurt, I'm here to tell you, God will heal you. He'll pick you up. He'll strengthen you. Amen. Praise God. He told her to get some empty vessels. You know, I've been thinking a lot about empty vessels or broken vessels. What kind of miracle can God perform when you give him what you have? <clears throat> you know, 2 Kings 4.3. He said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. You know, God can do a lot with broken or empty vessels. We don't have to go through all these scriptures, but this first one, I was thinking about, that's how I knew I was on the right track because the Lord gave, downloaded this scripture, this idea in my heart about being poured out like a drink offering. An empty vessel. See what I'm saying? An empty vessel. Something, it might have been full before, but it was poured out before the Lord. 
The book of Leviticus would later talk about the fact that that quart of wine would be poured out. It's a type of Jesus pouring out his blood for us along with the whole burnt offering. But the first, pour, the first uh, drink offering was in Genesis chapter 35 verse 14. I mean, listen, I know I didn't come here to preach Genesis 35 14 this morning. But it just gives even more added thought to this place called Bethel where Jacob laid his head that night. Where there was a vision in heaven and the heavens opened up and there was a ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending upon that ladder. And later Jesus would tell Nathaniel when he saw him under the fig tree, he said, greater things than, you, than these shall you see, for you will soon see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Basically, he's saying, I am the fulfillment of Jacob's ladder. I am the portal into heaven. If you want access to the presence of God, it's going to have to go through me. But on that night, when Jacob laid his head down on that rock, he poured out a drink offering on that rock. He poured out oil upon that rock. He, was, he, he poured it out. Jesus, I talked about this at the wedding of Canaan. He told them to get those water pots. I always talk about this. Maybe I talk about it too much. But that first miracle Jesus performed. Fill it up with what you have. But he changed the inside of the contents. He did a first, he did a conversion yes, miracle, a transformation miracle to the inner contents. Yes, he turned that ceremonial religious water into wine, a type of the work of what Jesus would do. You know, I was thinking about this, about how he poured out the oil and the wine on that rock, how Jesus turned the water into wine, how this woman brought in empty vessels and they were filled with oil. You know that word oil, we talk about this in 1 John 2.20, you have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One, the word is charisma, where we get the word charisma, charisma. You know what it means, huh? I told you, how many times have I taught you this? A smearing a smearing of oil. You have an anointing. That's why in the Old Testament they would pour the oil down Aaron's beard when they anointed him. That's why they poured the oil on young King David because they were anointing them for service. It's a type of the Holy Spirit. She brought in those, 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 those containers and the Lord filled it up. You know, but I was thinking <clears throat> that here she is. She's broken. She's empty. She brings these empty vessels for God to do something. And, and I couldn't help but think about that, that, that drink offering that Jacob poured out. And, he, and it poured oil and wine. And I thought about the Good Samaritan. And I know I kind of preached on him recently too. That's Jesus. He poured in the oil and the wine. The kind that restoreth my soul. Yes. He found me bleeding and dying on Jericho Road. I'm preaching to everybody in here today. He found us bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. But he poured in the oil and the wine. God's looking for some empty vessels that he can fill up. What he filled up in that woman's life that day was the oil. And the oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. And without the wine, there is no filling up of the Holy Spirit. Without the work of Jesus cleansing. That's what they use that wine for to cleanse, the, to cleanse those those sores, cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's what she needed more than anything was the oil of the Spirit in her life. She was, she was pain, she was in pain, she was desperate, she was empty. God filled her vessels with oil. Okay, point number two. They want to make my, my son slaves. They want to make my boys slaves. She want, they want to turn my sons into bondmen. The concern of every Christian parent, I believe, is that the enemy would enslave our children with sin. But i got to tell you something. God the Father is the greatest parent that ever lived. And what he's doing is he's looking down on earth and he says, The enemy has enslaved my creation in sin, but i got a plan. i got a plan that I'm going to send my son Jesus to set them free. God looked upon the fallen earth. He saw his creation enslaved by sin, but he had a plan to set them free. He never plans to leave us the way that we were. Yes. Amen. God is not going to leave you the way that you are if you just yes. trust him. Look at this. Freedom from slavery. This is my favorite Bible verse in the Bible. I used to sign a little book like this. And I'd sign it, no longer slaves. Look at this. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. It says, knowing this, that our old man. You know who your old man is? 
old man. Adam. First birth. That's why you got to be born again. Did you know that? Did you know that that's why you got to be born again? Because the first time you were born like your father Adam and you were born in sin and your old man was full of sin and he had a sinful nature that was ruling and reigning in the life. But look at this. It says, knowing this, our old man is crucified with him. See, in the mind of God, I know I used to get all radical about it and, and say, like, in the mind of God, you were born like Adam the first time, and you were born broken and dead, and I tried to make myself look broken and dead. But then on that day when you heard the glorious gospel, you might not have known the things that I'm telling you about in here. I, God knows I didn't know the things that I'm talking to you about the first time that I got, when I first got saved, but I felt a spiritual miracle take place in my life. I felt a burden of guilt fall off of me. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that you don't need to know much to get saved, but if you're going to walk and live for God, you you got to learn some stuff because you got to know where to put your faith whenever you find yourself in trying times. When you find yourself in times of your life where the enemy is whispering to you just to give up and to quit, you better know where to place your faith so that you can receive grace from the Lord. And let me tell you something. On that day when you got saved, whether you knew it or not, something wonderful happened in the spiritual realm. The first man that was born of Adam, the old man that was born in sin, was taken by the Holy Spirit and he was baptized or immersed into the person of Jesus. The Holy Spirit took you from over here and he put you into a new environment. And in the mind of God, hallelujah, in the mind of God, the old man that you were died with Jesus. You were crucified with him. That's what the father sees. The father sees that you died with him. You were buried with him. He says, so that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now, I need you to understand something. That this also, this old man, because I'm, I'm, I'm about to hit Romans 6. Freedom from slavery. Praise God. Point number two, they wanted to make my boys slaves. He says that the old man, the body of sin, let's talk about the sinful nature, might be destroyed that we henceforth should not be slaves to sin. It says serve sin in, in, in the King James, but to be honest with you, that's one place I think the New King James has it right. It says slaves to sin in the New King James. And the purchase price. Because you're no longer slaves. Praise God. You're no longer slaves. And the purchase price was the redemption that Jesus gave. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 through 25 Justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know what the word justified means? I know that I tell you all this a lot, but I'm trying to get you to, to, to scream it out, to say it so that you'll hold on to it. The word justified is a declaration from the Father where he says you're righteous. Amen. The enemy is going to do everything in your life to make you feel guilt and condemnation and to convince you that you are not righteous in the eyes of God. But I'm here to tell you that that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God declares you righteous, not based upon what you have done, but based upon what Jesus Jesus has done, but there's something that's supposed to happen. It's not a license to sin. It's not an okay to keep doing whatever you want to do, but that instead, when you get a revelation of that, see, I can say it all day long. I can say it every message that I preach. You've been justified through through the redemption that is in Christ. And you can, you can hear it, and I can try to explain it, and I can break it down and dissect it, but until the Holy Spirit gives you revelation of it, Opens up your eyes and lets you see. God really doesn't see me as guilty anymore. Because of what Jesus did. There's a freedom that takes place. A freedom and a liberty that takes place. And when that freedom happens, you know what the heart of man wants to do? He wants to live for Jesus, man. He wants to return the favor. Hallelujah. He wants to, he wants to tell somebody about the goodness of God. He wants to forsake all of those lies that were keeping him bound. Got to go. It was holding me down. The redemption, the purchase price, so that you wouldn't have to be a slave. That is in Christ who God set forth to be a propitiation. 
The idea is an appeasement. God was willing to look upon the sacrifice of Jesus and clear you, absolve you of all guilt. All right, I'm closing with this last scripture. Because you don't have to be a slave. This mama was worried that her sons were going to be slaves. God looked upon the earth and he saw that the enemy was trying to make his children slaves. I'm here to tell you that there is a, that there is a spiritual truth that is in place. You got, you got to just bear with me for three minutes. I've put you, I've put you through, through a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm just preaching away over here. But you got, you got to hear this last part. And you got, to, you got to leave with this in your heart, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 2. The, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What I need you to understand is, is that we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're not talking about the law of God in the Old Testament. We're talking about two spiritual laws. We're talking about the two most powerful spiritual laws on the face of the earth. One was enacted when Adam and Eve fell and sinned against God. The, spirit, the, the law of, 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 of sin and death was brought into existence and held man as a slave to its power. You know, some people would make the comment that, you know, the law of gravity was more powerful until the law of aerodynamics came into place. The law of sin was powerful on the earth until the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus came into place. What, what I need you to see here is this, is that there is a law of sin and death. There is a power behind sin. It tries to rule and keep alive the sinful nature of man. When the sinful nature is alive and aroused in the life and the heart even of a believer, then you ha don't have power to do what God has called you to do. But I'm here to tell you that the law of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's that prepositional phrase again. What is it trying to say? The old man born of Adam died in Christ, was buried with him, has been resurrected to newness of life, now is walking in Christ, has righteousness, been clothed, he's been clothed upon with the righteousness of Jesus, and now he can receive a download of the grace of God, the law of the spirit of life. It's the Holy Spirit that will bring victory in your life. Amen. I know that you're not in Bible college this morning, but I need you to know something. It's the law of the spirit of life. It's the Holy Spirit that will bring victory in your life today. Yes. We used to try to talk to people about the message of the cross. I'm like, oh yeah, but what about the Spirit? Man, you think I didn't think about the Spirit in this? The Holy Spirit is the one that does the work. He's the hands, the feet, the mouth of Jesus. He's the one that moves. He unshackles. He's the diffusing ray that shows up in your dungeon and causes the chains of bondage to be broken. But he does all of his work based upon in Christ Jesus. Everything that the Holy Spirit does for you can only be done for you because of what Jesus has already done for you.